In this video, we are going to be covering what's going on in the markets, some NFT drama, as well as some deep discounts that you can be getting on some blue chips during this market. So the first thing I want to talk about is going to be the market sentiment because the macro markets, which is basically how everything is affected overall, is going to affect the prices of NFTs, where the things mint out, where there's money flowing in. So let's go ahead and go on Dune Analytics, right? So these are all free tools that you definitely can use. I want to look at, you know, daily volume on OpenSea. And as you can see, end of April, early May, like there's a lot of volume happening. And it seems like, oh my God, like the NFT market is coming back. And then slowly but surely, you know, things are kind of dying off, especially because the macro markets overall in the entire world, things are kind of looking like it's going into a recession, right? I don't know for sure if that's going to happen, but markets have been bearish overall and the NFT markets definitely reflect that. And so as you can see, the volume overall on OpenSea has been decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. And so that's why you see there's not a lot of volume pumping into projects, especially when it comes to Ethereum stuff. The, a lot of the floor prices for a lot of established projects are kind of dropping. Even blue chips, right? They're dropping by like 40%, 50%. You know, just understand that that's how the market goes. These things come in cycles. Will things turn around and things become bullish again? Most likely because, you know, NFTs are here to stay. But right now it is is a bear market so you have to you know play the game a little differently because everything's not going to pump up like it did you know before so the first thing we're going to talk about is going to be azuki now azuki essentially is making a comeback where the floor before was like 28 eth but then it went all the way down to 7 eth and now it's like 14 eth right after the whole zagabond thing and was it was a scam was it not whatever right but overall in my personal eyes azuki made a pretty strong rebound a lot of people in the community you know made a lot of friends in the community and they're holding on pretty strong because they really believe in the company they believe in the mission and beans as well as you know it's 1.7 as well so beans are bouncing back as well and i think overall as a brand azuki is still pretty strong despite of all the things that happened in the past azuki is still azuki the team is still a team and it, it seems like they're going to continue to do what they promise recently there's this twitter account called nft ethics where they kind of just like expose people and stuff like that i'm not sure if they themselves did the doxing or someone else did it first but essentially zagabond you know which is he the person involved in all the drama he has been doxed and nft ethics like wrote this entirely long thread honestly when i was reading it uh, i don't hold any azukis or beans right now so you know, I'm just going to come in with a more neutral perspective. I feel like sometimes these accounts, they're fishing for stories. And when they're fishing for stories, they'll make up a story or they'll create a certain narrative or angle to make someone look bad or, you know, to generate clicks. But from my perspective, reading this, it's just kind of saying like, hey, this is the guy. He worked at all these big companies like Amazon and da 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 da. He's well connected in the VC world. And it's like, okay, great. Isn't that a good thing you would want in the founder if they're starting a project? Wouldn't you want them to be connected with VCs? Wouldn't you want them to have like legit? experience at tech companies i feel like a lot of times things might be blown out of proportion yes there has been like fud and stuff like that with like whatever they did in the past with like funks and things like that i would even treat that as like a separate thing when you go into someone's past and you just go into like who they know their network and like where they worked it's kind of like if their background is kind of legit doesn't really like saying all these things don't really like tear them down it's just like saying like hey this is patrick he used to work at this place and he has he's friends with these people it's like okay you know despite what people say despite what people do i feel like the zuki community is actually pretty strong i think this kind of fud doesn't make that much of a dent in their reputation anymore which is great for them as a community the past is the past yes there's a stain on the brand reputation because of you know the past projects but at the same time i think it's important to look at what they're doing now what they're doing in the future to see if they're actually going to pull through to see if they're actually acting as a proper company and doing the right thing by their holders. Everybody make mistakes. So, you know, that just is what it is. And, you know, when it comes to doxing, right, it's actually kind of interesting. And I think my my boy Nano Bushido over here put it in a nice, simple way. He said, there's something just off about doxing people against their own will, even if you don't agree with what they did, right? It creates a really weird situation where I think according to the American law, like doxing people like is actually illegal, I believe, right? It's kind of weird that like, I'm not going to call out any specific accounts, right? Because I don't know who docs who and I'm not trying to be coffeezilla over here if you're an account or you're a personality and you dox another person technically you're kind of bending the rules of the laws in order to create a story i'm not the moral police or anything but i'm just saying that if your whole purpose is to bring justice and it's to build a better community but you have to do it by kind of bending the rules in order to do that and you're not even sure if that is going to make things better it's kind of strange and a little bit hypocritical in my opinion if you're talking about Zuki, they kind of like making amends they're trying to make it right they're returning the money they're giving the contract so it's like there's no reason to like continuously like bother people just to like create a story people should probably focus on the present and the future more than the past although you can learn from the past and a lot of times you know history rhymes it is important to focus on the future for any project really but enough about that let's go ahead and move on to the next project next project we're going to talk about is going to be Carl 
Carl Fru. Now, during the time of this recording, right, Carl Fru is minting. They recently just finished the Dutch auction and they're gonna be moving into the whitelist mint. I had a whitelist, so I also minted one as well. But it seems like the floor price right now is 0 0.38, which is lower than the Dutch auction price, which is interesting, right? It doesn't mean the project is not a good project. You know, it still is Carl Fru. They still have the brand. They're still doing everything that they were. The difference is that because we're kind of moving into a macro bear market, like any project that launches right now will have a difficult time minting when it comes to like sustaining floor price and things like that. So I think you have to really look at things from a macro perspective to understand like if the project is actually good or not, because anything's minting, it's, it's kind of hard to like build that hype, especially if the supply is going to be like 15,000 for this one, which is a little bit high on, on the higher side for sure. But it is their second collection. So, you know, I understand. But I think when you look at these kind of projects, there's two things, right? One is that you have to pay attention to the macro markets, where are things going? If everything's going down anyways, then things are going to go down, right? So everyone's down bad. But if you believe in the project and you believe that they have strong fundamentals, then when it's down, maybe that's also an opportunity to buy certain traits or certain special traits that might give you benefits down the line. So if you're like more of a longer term investor and you believe in fundamentals, you do actually want to buy when things are down. But if you're looking for a quick flip, this is probably not it because, you know, like there's not many quick flips on Ethereum right now in general. You might have to move on to the Solana chain for that. You know, for me, I'm just going to hold it long term because I believe in the team and, you know, the team is pretty much my friends now. That's just my personal take. And you can also say I'm a little biased with the car through 3D. I mean, the thing that people may not know is that when you buy the 3D one, you're kind of getting like a few NFTs and one like wrapped together. So you're going to get a voxel version, which is connected to the 3D. You're going to get a 2D version. So you're actually getting multiple NFTs like put together instead of like having them be separate. Like Harfu said, there's going to be the hype piece and at most traits. And then those traits are going to have potentially free airdrops or potential mints by hype piece and at most as they continue into their NFT journey. So if you're looking to snipe some of those opportunities when things are down bad, sometimes that might be a good time to do it. Because if you believe in like Atmos as a company and hype as a company, which is still going strong in the Web2 world, then when things pick up again, that might be an opportunity, right? Be greedy when people are being fearful in a sense, but also be careful that you're not catching a falling knife because like things might be down bad right now, but they can even get worse, right? Just understand your risk to reward ratio and be comfortable with what you invest, right? Because at the end of the day, it is kind of like a gamble and flipping a coin, but you know, it is what it is. And if you want to learn more about Carrefour, make sure to check out the interview I did with one of the co-founders, J. Joe. We really went deep into everything Carrefour. It's like a one hour interview. So make sure to check that out. If you want to just learn more, right? And by the way, make sure to follow me on Twitter at Patrick Dang, where I'm going to be dropping the latest alpha and updates on our latest NFT. And make sure to join our Parallax Discord, where we're going to be doing live AMAs every single week. And it's a community for us to hang out, talk about what's going on in the NFT space. So what I want to do next is I want to talk about some high quality projects that are considered blue chip. You know, these days, I don't really like using that word anymore because like things change so fast in the NFT space that blue chip is not the right word because things can go up and down real quick. But I want to just share with you, you know, some of the projects that have been holding pretty strong when it comes to a community aspect, when it comes to a floor aspect so that you can kind of like pay attention to it because, you know, the projects that can like thrive during a bear market probably can like do really well during a bull. So let's go ahead and get into that. So the first project that I'm personally looking at is going to be Clone X. The floor right now is a solid 14 ETH floor and it's been pretty consistent at that. And why I'm looking at Clone X right now is because one, they have a lot of supply, but the floor price is actually pretty high, right? And also because I feel like they've been executing really well when it comes to a brand perspective and building community. When we look at, you know, what's been going on with their live events, even during this bearish period, we have a lot of people like hanging out, having concerts and stuff like that. Takashi Murakami is even here. Steve Aoki is going to be over here as well. And so it's pretty interesting. And the community itself, like I did reach out to some of the people that worked at Artifact Studios, like some of the, I think, moderators or like team that helps with this events kind of stuff. They're pretty open. Like you don't have to have a clone X to go to these events. You can like just hang out and talk to people. And so that's something I really appreciate. Outside looking, I don't have a clone X, right? But like when I see people on Twitter and like check out the Discord and stuff like that, it seems like people are more on the creative side, like artists and musicians or like people that like to create stuff, right? It seems like there's a lot of those type of people in there, people that like streetwear, sneakers and stuff, which I also like as well. So that's definitely a community that I am definitely eyeing during this bear market to see if maybe I might be able to get into a nice entry into that. I know there are other people out there, other influencers that are like, oh, I don't really like Artifact Studios because they're greedy and whatever, right? Everyone has their own opinion, but that's just my personal take. And as someone who doesn't have one yet and is looking to get one possibly in the future. So I'm trying to be as objective as possible because if I didn't like it, then I wouldn't think about spending my money there, right? So the next project I'm gonna talk about is gonna be Murakami Flowers. You know, a lot of people say like, you know, Takashi Murakami, iconic artist for sure. But if you kind of look at his past, there's like instances where his business almost went bankrupt or maybe it did went bankrupt. I'm not sure, I, I look into the details. You know, he also tried to make like animated movie kind of thing and that didn't work out pretty well. So from a business perspective, some things didn't work out that well, but from an iconic artist standpoint and everybody knows who he is, things are going pretty well for Takashi Murakami, right? And I feel like because his art is so like signature, it's like so many people try to copy. It's so iconic, like everybody knows it. Like when I go to a museum, especially in like California and stuff, like I'm delighted to go to Takashi Murakami exhibit, right? Essentially, 
it's pretty interesting to me. I think it attracts a certain crowd of people that like this stuff. It's not for everybody. Not everybody likes fine art. Not everybody gets like why they would want to go to a museum and stuff like that. Some people are more into the gaming side, for example, right? But for me, it's pretty cool. And I would like to meet more people like who are interested in this type of community. So for me, I kind of just look at who are the type of people that I would personally like want to hang out with just like just for fun. And then I kind of look for like NFTs that are able to, you know, get those people to gravitate towards that art. And so that's something I'm looking at. And if you look at the Murakami flower seed, I think this might be like a low key sleeper because if we look at the clone X vials, like 23 ETH just for the vial, right? So it's like people are just holding on to it because some people want to roll a dice and get a rare one later on when they activate the clone vial. So for the seed, it's like maybe it could be a play. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's going to make the money for sure. I'm just saying that if you did hold on to a seed and, and if you could hold on to it for a long time, maybe people will slowly like keep hatching their seeds. And then one day, you know, there's only going to be like a few hundred or maybe like less than a hundred of these seeds and people are going to want like a specific rare one that still haven't been found. So that might be something interesting, but it only works if you're willing to hold it for a long time because you can't expect the price of this to pump, especially during a bear market. Another project that I'm coming around to is going to be Invisible Friends. Now, I said before in my previous videos, like a long time ago, I was like, you know, what's the whole deal with Invisible Friends? All it is is art, right? And at the same time, it is kind of art, but I feel like it's kind of been morphing into a brand where people really like it. You know, it's kind of like Doodles, for example. Doodles is art, but then it's turning into this whole brand. And I feel like Invisible Friends is kind of walking in that direction. But, you know, with their collaboration with Kif, which makes it's kind of like the stamp of approval in the Web2 space and creates more legitimacy where a brand like that, which is very considered as pretty high status in the streetwear world, is collaborating with them directly. Then with that collaboration, they're also expanding into like physical clothes, like merchandise, right? Like actual streetwear clothes. So for Kith, right, if you go on like StockX and stuff, you know, you can actually resell your Kif clothes for a profit. They're pretty expensive and people, a lot of people want it, right? So they understand that supply and demand dynamic. If Invisible Friends is able to capture that attention as well, kind of move in that streetwear industry and then, I mean, streetwear is like huge industry, like billions and billions and billions of dollars is spent on streetwear every year. So if they're able to tap into that industry, create revenue streams outside of just creating more NFTs, but like selling clothes like that people would want to buy and then, and then actually have those clothes be of something of resale value and, and it's something that can like sustain in the market. That'd be pretty interesting, right? Like you can basically create like a web three version of like Supreme in a sense. I'm watching it. I don't have any myself, but it's just something that definitely caught my attention recently where when I first saw it, it was just like, oh, it's just another art project. And then now it's evolving into something more. And I love to watch like projects evolve and like prove me wrong, right? Uh, next project I'm gonna talk about is going to be Doodles. You know, as we talked about in the last videos, Doodles has that duplicator and stuff like that. And we're not really sure what it is, but it seems like a lot of people do like Doodles. A lot of VCs as well like Doodles as well. And they think of it as like a long-term investment. So that makes me a little bit more bullish on it. I don't have any Doodles myself. I've been listening to a couple clips of, you know, some of the leaders at Doodles when they do interviews on YouTube and stuff. It seems like they're really thinking big when it comes to like how many people they can onboard into the space. So instead of thinking like, oh, we're gonna do like 10,000 and then we're gonna do a second drop, we're gonna do another 10,000 and then we'll just like expand slowly like that. They're thinking, how do we get millions of people into the Doodles ecosystem? Obviously, the price points are gonna have to be different from what we're used to to be able to do that. But I can't appreciate anybody thinking big on, you know, expanding the pie and onboarding new people into the space without having them spend like, you know, five or $10,000 just to like buy an NFT, right? Especially because it's so risky. So anybody who has a plan to onboard a lot of people, I'm definitely bullish on that. Definitely something that I'm gonna do a little more research on as well because I'm interested to see from the marketing perspective what their strategy is and kind of like get some clues there and see if other projects are doing that as well. And the next project we're going to talk about is going to be PXN. Obviously, one of the friends of the show, Ray, who did an interview with us. If you want to check that out, go ahead. It's quite insightful, actually. The floor price right now is, you know, 1.69. Obviously, the Dutch auction was going to be two ETH, so it's lower than a Dutch auction, which is fine, which, you know, it's a bear market it is what it is, especially for a new project. I'm curious to see how this is going to go, right? It could be a sleeper where they're building a lot of consumer apps, like they're building like a Discord alternative. They're building a, like a marketplace, kind of like an eBay, but for crypto. Well, quick update on that. I just received the tweet where Ray is saying that he's not building a Discord alternative because Discord is like a billion dollar company. It's kind of hard to like compete against them. They're not building a Discord alternative. They're building a chat, which they will need on their platform, which kind of makes sense, right? So if, if you're able to buy and sell like stuff using Ethereum and Bitcoin and stuff on their platform, you're going to need a place to chat because you want to talk to the vendor, for example. So maybe that's the direction they're going to go. And somehow all these products are going to tie into like one beast of a monster, kind of like how Salesforce has like, uh, if you're not familiar with Salesforce, like B2B software, but like Salesforce has a bunch of different products that, and they're all glued together in one central hub 
up and I'm following along because it's like, there's not many projects that are ambitious in that sense where they have like a nice PFP and then they choose not to like, just be only a nice picture, but actually try to build like serious software products behind it. I can always appreciate that kind of effort because it's not easy. It's definitely not easy because I think Ray is a pretty good founder. He's pretty good at leading teams. So, you know, you're kind of betting on the person, not necessarily like the utility of it, but betting the person can figure out what the utility will be and bring value into the market. And I'm following, I'm a holder, check it out and see if you want to uh, get into it. If, if the price is, you know, right for you. And so with that said, that's everything that we got to cover for this video. And I will see you guys in the next one.